Okay, here we go. Try this, please. Let's try. Try that, please. Let's go. Let's go. So we got to do, we got to sketch curve here. Okay. So there's a couple approaches to this. It's an absolute value function. So we can deal with this in a number of ways. Now, first of all, what's the domain? Are there any values that are restricted? No. No, no there are not. Fine. I really like finding the derivative. What are we doing? Yeah, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to find a derivative. Right. So how do we deal with an absolute value function? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Just turn it into a piecewise turn it into a piecewise function. Exactly. Good. Okay, so we could write this as the piecewise function. It is itself whenever the argument is positive, right? Mm -hmm. So the absolute value of hand is just equal to hand whenever hand is positive, right? right? right. So it's equal to plain old 3x plus 4 whenever 3x plus 4, which is hand, is greater than 0, right? Okay, but we don't want to write that in terms of hand. We want to solve it for x, right? Because mm -hmm. our domains are always written in terms of x. So what do we do to, to solve for x there? Divide by zero. Add four to the other side. Well, about subtract four to the other side, and then divide by three. So whenever x is greater than negative four thirds. Okay. So we also know that it's going to equal the opposite of hand. Whenever hand is negative. Well, what's the only thing that's going to change if I solve that for x with a less than sign? Positive sign. Yeah. All it's going to be is just that, right? Does that make sense? And so then this has at x equals negative 4 thirds at 0, right? Right? So if we were to graph this thing, what is an absolute value function? If it's a linear function, what's it always look like? Uh. Yeah, like a, like a B, right? So it's going to look like, you know, it's going to look like that, right? So tell me what's going to happen here when we differentiate this thing just by looking at what we know the graph looks like. Where should we expect to have a critical number? At, well, at wherever the point is, right? Because that's a sharp corner. And what do we know about derivatives and sharp corners? Don't exist, right? They're undefined, right? Zero is where you get a, a horizontal yeah. tangent, a smooth peak or valley. This is a sharp valley, and so, yeah, it's a critical number, right? But it's the kind where the derivative is undefined. So if we were to differentiate this, what do we get? Okay, so finding the derivative, y prime would equal the piecewise function. Well, what's the derivative of this piece? Three. 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 So it's three whenever x is greater than negative four-thirds, it's, what's the derivative of that one? Zero. Negative three. Negative three, the bottom one, when x is less than negative four-thirds. And the derivative, well, and what's in between? Well, it's a Nothing. sharp corner, yeah? I mean, it, because we have a, going from a positive constant slope to a negative constant slope means sharp corner, doesn't it? So it's right. So it's undefined, right. So at x equals, uh, it's undefined at x equals negative four thirds, so that's our critical number, right? Okay, make sense? Yeah. And so, really, that's if I differentiate again, I'm just going to get zero for everything, right? Yeah. So the second derivative in this case doesn't really have any meaning, does it? There is no concavity to this function. Agreed. Yeah. There's no concavity because there's no curvature. Concavity assumes some kind of curvature. There's no curvature. You, it can't be bowl shaped anything, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So our table this time actually is pretty simple. This is this ends up being an easier problem than a lot of them. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Yeah. 
There's our x-axis. We got y. We got y prime. We don't even really need the y double prime row, right? There certainly are going to be no, there's nothing to say about y double prime. Yep. How do we know when to just stop at x prime or x or go all the way to x double? Well, you, OK, so good question. So if a question is asking for inflection points, you don't have a choice. It's asking for inflection points, you got to go all the way down to y double prime, which we did, but we just get nothing for an answer, right? There are no, it's just zero everywhere, so it just kind of fell apart in this case. But normally, like on all the other examples that we've done and we will do, we, if it's asking for inflection points, you got to take the second derivative. If it's not asking for inflection points, if it's only asking for extrema, then you do the second derivative if it's easy. If it's really easy to do, you go ahead and take the second derivative because the second derivative test is easier to use than the first derivative test. But that's sort of an optional thing there, right? Yeah. OK. Uh, so for this one, I mean, we'll add this other row, I guess, but it's not going to do anything. We had one critical number at negative 4 thirds where the first derivative was undefined. And the second derivative is undefined everywhere. Right. I mean, I'm mean, not undefined. It's zero everywhere, so it doesn't do us any good. So if we want to know what this is, what are we going to have to fall back on? Test points in the first derivative test, right? We'll have to test the sign of the first derivative, go clear back to section, like, what that was, 3, 3 or something like that, right, where, where we're just relying on the first derivative. So let's pick some test points. What's an easy one to the left? Um, Negative 2. What's an easy one to the right? Zero. How about zero, right? Okay. So then what's the sign of the first derivative when x is negative 2? Where are we then? Which part of the domain are we in? Bottom one, right? Negative 2 would be less than negative 4 thirds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. So if I plug in negative 2, I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get 3 times negative 2 is negative 6 plus 4 is negative 2 mm -hmm. times negative 1? Positive. Positive. Okay. So I get a positive slope down below. Is that right? Oh, first, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, what am I doing? Yeah, I was thinking that's not right. I was plugging it into the function. We want to plug it in here. It doesn't even matter, right? If we plug it in to the bottom part of the domain, it's just constant, but it's negative, isn't it? Right? So that's what we want. Negative, and then if we plug in zero, zero is greater than negative 4 thirds, so it's, it's living in the top part of the function, it's and it's positive. And so what do we get? That, so right? Wait, so, how do we... so then we could find the other, oops, wow, that was fast. Okay, hang on, hold on, hold on, questions? Okay, we're not quite done. We have to anchor with a point, don't we? Yes. Right, so then at this x value, what's the value of y at x equals negative 4 thirds? Zero, right? Because look what that does. I get 3 times negative 4 thirds is negative 4 plus 4 is 0. Absolute value of 0 is 0, right? And we already knew that anyway. So we've got the point 0, 0, which by the first derivative test, it's undefined, so it's a sharp corner. And we're going from a decreasing slope to an increasing slope. So it's a V, right? Yep. See what I'm saying? And so that's it. That's all we need to know. That's our, if we want to sketch this thing, it's pretty boring. It just looks like a V with the vertex at negative 4 thirds 0. So it doesn't matter if it's upside down. No, it does matter if it's upside down. It, it, but it can't be upside down because if this is, so negative 4 thirds is like right there, let's say. Yes. Okay, we know that it's, it's got to be a minimum. Right? It's a sharp minimum, so we know that it's doing that. If we want to know what the exact slopes are, we'll, you know, it's a sketch. We don't care. Yep. I'm sorry, I was writing in your talking. Could you start from where the test points again and where I plug that into the positive yep. and the Right, so, the, so for the first derivative test, you're evaluating the test points in the first derivative. Okay. So we're plugging in negative 2 into our first derivative which goes down here, which tells me that we get back a negative first derivative. So okay. hence, we get the negative sign. Okay, At 0, that puts us into the 
top part of the domain where the derivative is positive, we get positive. Okay. And then, then we just use the, we, we know, how do we say that? If we've got a sharp corner, because it's undefined, and we go from decreasing, that means walking downhill to walking uphill, that means a sharp valley. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Okay, let's do another one. We need to do, want to do a trig one? Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's do something like... Okay, so they give us the domain, right? Within that domain, there are no places where the Functions undefined, it's just cosines, right? Yeah. Okay. So on to the next step. Derivative. 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 So differentiate it. So y prime is what? What's the first term going to give us? Sine x. Okay. Second term. Negative. No. Okay. So I'm going to get a negative times a negative is a positive, right? And then I'm going to get, I'll leave the one half out front. Now, this is chain rule stuff, isn't it? Oh, yeah. So the derivative of cosine hand is? Two. Is two. Negative two. sine two. hand, yeah. right? So they're negative times negative is positive. But then the derivative of hand is? Two. Two times one half cancels. What? Right? Oh. Oh, yeah. Do you want me to write it all out? Yeah. Okay. It'll be positive. But then your parentheses. So. Positives. I can so minus negative sine 2x times 2, right? What happened to the half? Oh, one half. Okay. Okay. Right, so now we can simplify that. So that's just equal to negative times negative is positive. 2 times 1 half cancels. So I get a sine, a positive sine 2x minus sine x, right? Uh, because I've got a negative times a negative. Okay, so you just switch. Put it out front. Put the positive term first. Okay. We good? Okay. So while we're at it, let's go ahead and take the second derivative. We'll come back and do some work with the first derivative, but moving down to the second derivative, what do we get? Deri derivative of sine hand is cosine hand times the derivative of hand is 2. And then minus derivative of sine x cosine x. Salute. Okay, so now, now we've got to do a little work here. We've got to go back and find critical numbers, right? Yeah. So no place are either of these derivatives going to be undefined. They're fine. They're just sines and cosines. Those are well-behaved. No tangents or anything that's got asymptotes in it. No. But we've got to solve this equation. We've got to set this equal to 0 and solve. So, so let's work on that. Sine 2x minus sine x equals 0. So to solve that, we need to use our double angle formula, right? So what is the sine of 2x equal to? And these really help to know. No. This is the 2 sine x cosine x. What we trade that for. How does that help though? Because, well, okay, now remember we, we dealt with this a couple times. Dealt with this a couple times. We can't do any algebra here if we're not comparing the same kinds of angles. Oh, okay. Right? So when we're solving a trig equation, what we first have to be able to do is hopefully factor the trig equation into factors involving 
only one kind of trig function, okay. right? We can't factor this, if A, because there are two terms, there's, and there's nothing I can factor out because this is a different kind of sign than that is, right? So we'll trade this one for a 2 sine x cosine x minus sine x equals 0, and that's good because now I can factor. What can I factor out? A sine. A sine x, yeah. So if I pull a sine x out front, I'm left with, what, 2 cosine x minus 1 equals 0, right? So. Okay. Yeah. So you did the product to correct them? Uh, no, no. We don't have to. We're not differentiating here. We're just doing algebra, right? right? Oh. Lost again. Okay. So let's let, let me everyone focus up here. Just quietly watch for a second. Let me talk you through these steps, and then just so don't try to follow. Don't don't do too much in your head here. Just follow what I'm saying for a second. So all we're doing, right? We have this. Here is our first derivative, right? Yeah. This is y prime. All we're doing is finding critical numbers by shifting into algebra and trig mode, right? We did the calculus. Now we're going to set this equal to zero and solve. There are some, there's a couple things we have to think about. There's a couple things we have to think about though because this is a little more complicated because it's a trig equation. So we had to take this sine 2x and trade it for trig functions with angles x, right, by using a trig identity. And I'm at some point, you know, I just got to make you guys re-memorize those. We'll do that later, though. So sine 2x, we traded for a 2 sine x cosine x. And now we're able to factor this in terms of individual trig functions, right? So factor out a sine x, and we get the factored equation sine x times the quantity 2 cosine x minus 1 equals 0. Okay, this is good because now we can apply the zero product property, right? We know that this product equals 0 when one of two things happens, when either sine x equals zero, sine x equals zero or 2 cosine x minus 1 equals 0, right? But how do you get numbers? Okay, we get numbers from by unit circle. So if we solve this for cosine x, this is when cosine x equals 1 half. So we got to go back to the unit circle yet again and ask ourselves the question, okay, first of all, where does sine x equals 0? That's an easy one. Sine x, that's the vertical component, right? So it's going to be at there. And really, what I want you to do first is just identify the places on the unit circle, and then you can find the corresponding angles in your domain next, right? So it's going to be at these two places on the unit circle. So in my domain, what values would, would those include? Zero, yeah. pi, two pi. Zero pi, two pi, right? Good. So we get those values, 0 pi, 2 pi. So let's make a list of our first derivative critical numbers, 0 pi, 2 pi. And that's for sine x. That's for sine x, right? That's for that factor. But we have more possible solutions. Where does cosine x equal 1 half? So that's going to be over a little, up a lot. So that's going to be there, right? Yeah. And there, there, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Where the x coordinate equals 1 half. What are those two angles going to be? Pi, well, let's, over, three. pi over 3. Pi, pi, pi over three. 3, and then pi back pi off. Pi five, 5 thirds pi, right? 2 pi minus pi over 3, right? Yeah. Okay, so we can add pi thirds and. 5 thirds pi. So those are all of our first derivative critical numbers. Okay? Lots of them. How do you know if you don't choose the um, actual fractions or the radians? Do you know what I mean? You have to use the unit circle. You can't use like the triangles. Yeah, you you have to use, you mean to use degrees or radians? Yeah. You'd have to use radians. Always? Because, yeah, yeah, because, and once again, because if we're talking about values of x here that are actual numbers, I mean, these are 0 and 2 pi. Those aren't arbitrary. Those mean something, right? Those are distances around the unit circle. But degrees are completely arbitrary. We just said, how about 360? And you want it to be exact. Yeah, we want something that has some inherent meaning, right? Okay. So, 
So there, there are the first derivative critical numbers. Now we've got to do something similar for the second derivative. So we've got to solve this trig equation, right? We're going to set that equal to zero. Same kind of thing. We've got to turn cosine 2x into something involving trig functions of x. Now we've got some choices. Wouldn't it be best to write this in terms of cosine probably? Yeah. Because there's three ways we can write this. And I, we talked about this earlier. You know, this is just maybe almost something to memorize. The one that we're going to use for cosine 2x is the quantity 2 cosine squared x minus 1. And we've got 2 times that whole thing. Okay? So that, that's the trade we're making. That, that's a trig identity. So then all we've got to do is just distribute the 2 and rewrite this in quadratic form. How are right? supposed to know? Well, you know, honestly, that's something, that's why I'm going to make you just memorize this stuff. And it's, I'm glad you bring that up because those are the kinds of things that, I, you know, you know how I feel about memorizing stupid facts. I'm not a big fan of it. It's low-level thinking. It just wastes brain cells. But this is not a low-level fact because this is something that we use all the time when you're doing math. The unit circle, it just, I mean, you'll do it in college. If you take physics in college or you take, you're going to, you know, uh, some kind of biophysics, right? And whatever you do, you're going to do, you're going to use trig functions. And so you're going to use this stuff a lot. What you want to do is break your train of thought as little as possible. So you want, you want these just to be kind of things where you don't even really have to think about it. You know, it just kind of pops out and you keep thinking about the important stuff. Yep. So sine 2x was a property too? Yes. Yeah, those are just trig identities. And we don't even know that? Well, you knew it last year, but you just haven't used it very much this year. Sine two x is just a double angle identity. Is all it is. I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing. There's nothing profound about it. It's just something to memorize. You know? Yeah. So um, the trig identity statement. Yeah. It wasn't very well done. So cosine two x equals two cosine x minus. Right. Cosine two x equals the the most basic form of that. Cosine two x is replaced by cosine squared x minus sine squared x. And sine x is. Sine. But. With sine x, sine squared x is the same as 1 minus cosine squared x. And so you could rewrite that to either read 2 cosine squared x minus 1, or 1 minus 2 cosine squared x, or cosine squared x minus sine squared x, whichever one seems best for the problem. In this case, I'm choosing that one because we have another cosine x. So you have three right? options. Yeah, we have three options. Oh, yeah. So if I distribute, I get 4 cosine squared x minus cosine x minus 2 equals 0, right? And so now I'm just solving this solving this trig equation. Well, this is kind of a bad one because it's quadratic. It's not that bad. It's not horrible, though, right? So, so no, we can't. We have to factor it. Okay. Yeah, but that's just squaring the cosine. B squared minus. So you have a cosine left over, so you use on the other side. So then this is the same thing as saying 4 times... Cosine x squared minus cosine x minus 2. So pretend those are like x's or something, right? Yep. We're just going to, we have to, does this factor? I don't think so. Yeah. Four times, so we're going to get, there are no numbers that multiply to negative 8 and add to negative 1. So we'd have to use like Pythagorean theorem, right? Nope. Nope. So we'd get like our x equals negative Plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. That was really pretty. That was very pretty. Okay, so what do we get? So that gives us 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 plus 16. So 17? No, 32. So square root of 33? Where are you? Did I do that wrong? What? Where are you getting these numbers from? Okay, because A. B. C. B is negative 1. Okay. So this was, this is kind of a bad one. Wait, why did you pick this problem? I don't know why I picked this one. This is probably a bad one to pick. Just keep going. Sorry. Yeah, you're already, you're already there. Just keep going.
And it is that bad. Okay. So, yikes. Okay, so, so then. Over eight. Over eight. This is what we struggle with every time we go. Okay, I would never give this to you on a test. I mean, this is pretty bad. Pretty bad. So, what would we do then? We would turn these into, I've got two, two values of x that I would have to, of, I'm sorry, of cosine x. Right, cosine x equals this stuff, right? So I've got two values of cosine that I would have to go back and take arc cosines of, right? Okay, that's pretty bad. Let's, let's just pretend, let's pretend for a moment that this one was only asking for first derivative. Yeah, for first derivative stuff, how about? Okay, just because it's going to take too long to finish. So we had all these... We had all of these critical numbers up here, right? So these are the ones that show up in our table, right? Okay, let's make a table. And we actually do have the second derivative right here. So we could even evaluate the sign of the second derivative and use the second derivative test, right? Okay, make sense? So let's write down, I'm going to grab some stuff for the next page. This is really all the stuff I need right there. I'll tell you why in a second. And the, are we still going to use the first derivative test at all? No, we'll just okay. use the second derivative test. Okay, okay can so you do that sometimes and just skip a. Sure. And we don't need to, we don't use both, we use one or the other. We don't really need to use both. You don't, so you don't have to find the critical numbers of your second derivative if you already have them from the first derivative? Right, if you're not, right. If you're not looking for inflection points, you don't even need the, the critical oh, okay. numbers of the second derivative. Does everybody get that? Are you yeah. kidding me? Right. No, I'm not kidding you. It makes it a lot easier. If we're not looking for inflection points, there's no reason to have the critical numbers of the second derivative. We're just going to use the second derivative function to apply the second derivative test, right? And that'll, that'll tell us where it's which if it has... It'll tell us the concavity at the first derivative critical numbers, which tells us if they're minima or maxima. Okay? So here's what we got then. Here's our table. So putting these in order, let's see, we're going from negative 2 pi, well, actually 0, minus. sorry, 0 up to 2 pi, wasn't it? Yes. 0 up to 2 pi, we had y, y prime. So 0 pi thirds pi. 5 thirds pi and 2 pi were all places where the first derivative was equal to 0, correct? So all we have to do now is find the value of the second derivative, the sign of the second derivative at those places. So there's our second derivative function. Let's evaluate the sign at 0. So when x is 0, what's the cosine of 2 times 0? Cosine of 0. 1 times 2 is 2. Minus, doesn't matter, the maximum value of cosine is 1. So it's positive, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So we get positive. What about at pi thirds? So the cosine of 2 times pi thirds is the cosine of 2 thirds pi. Let's put a unit circle up here. 2 thirds pi is going to be, come on, virtual length is going right there, right? So that's minus 1 half, right? Times 2 is negative 1, right? Yeah. So negative 1 minus cosine of pi third. Well, that's going to be, it's going to make it more negative, isn't it? Well, even if it makes it positive, uh, cosine of pi thirds actually is, yeah, it's positive. So it's going to make it more negative, right? So this is negative. I get a negative answer minus some more makes it more negative. At pi, what do we get? Well, cosine of 2 pi is 0, minus cosine of pi is negative 1. Uh, cosine of pi minus, oh, hang on, I got that wrong. Cosine of, that's 1, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I get 2 minus 1 is positive. Wait, minus minus 1, because isn't it negative 1 minus 1? 
Well, honestly, it doesn't matter because this is equal to 2. And so because that's 2, subtracting cosine can only maximum value of 1, right? So no matter what, it's positive. 5 thirds pi. This will be trickier. So cosine of 2 times is 10 thirds pi. So what is that? That's 3 and a third? Yeah. So we'll go 2 pi, 3 pi, and a third, and a third takes us down to there. Okay. So that's minus 1 half times 2 is negative 1 minus cosine of 5 thirds pi is going to be a positive value, right? Whoa. So it's negative. Okay. Right? Yeah. 2 pi is the same as 0, so it's positive. Right? Right? They're in the same place on the unit circle. Okay? And zero? How do we kind of know that it's going to be? So this is kind of like a wave. Kind of, yeah. Now, in order for us to be more specific with this, what we would do is we would go back and say, okay, well, let's plug these into, let's plug these into the function to find out what these ordered pairs are so we can kind of anchor those points, right? I'm not going to take time to do it, but we could. Then all we know here is that you tell me what kind of a thing is this? If we have a horizontal tangent and a positive concavity, what is that? Smiley. That's smiley. That's a minimum. This is going to be a maximum. That's a minimum. This is maximum. And this is a minimum. And if we connect those with the actual values of these points, that's our sketch. Right? Do we want to, should we just a few of them? No. Okay, it's up to you. Yeah. Uh, so, like, if pi over three was a positive, mm -hmm. and then so pi was positive, but then you went back and pi pi over three was a negative, what would that be? Or would you ever have that? Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, because obviously all of those would then be minimums. Uh. Like, I know it wouldn't happen if, with this particular equation, but if you ever got critical numbers where you like. Like these were two positives in a row or something? Yeah. Oh, then that would just mean that, well, no, you, no, no. But you, then, but you then can't. There was, yeah, yeah, but then there was like a critical point after that that made that was negative. So there was obviously a change mm -hmm. for yeah. some yeah. Or would you ever get that? Well, OK, would, would you, let me, you answer your own question for me. Could I ever have two actual extrema in a row that both had positive concavity? No. You so can't. You don't absolutely. Get, right. So if you get two positives or two negatives in a row, that just means the equation is like trailing off. Well, that means the only way that could happen is if there were like an asymptote in there or something. Okay. Wait, I thought yeah. it could happen. Positive one, really going up and then going up. Okay, but now now think about that. So if I've got if I've got a positive concavity, and how could I without unless I have like either a break in the function or I get some other kind of place where I get a critical number. It's going to be an undefined critical number. Right, I have to have an undefined critical number, but I don't have any, right? So how could I have another smooth, how could I follow that with another smooth minimum without having a maximum in between? So it have to be a you, you couldn't, could you? Couldn't you do the S thing where it just, it, like, stop, it just goes horizontal? Right, okay, true. But we also knew that none of these were zeros of the second derivative. They were going to be weird. Right. If we go back to this previous page, the zeros, where is that? The zeros of the second derivative were going to be bizarre, non-regular points on the unit circle. So we weren't going to have those lined up. So we knew those definitely were not inflection points. Right. I mean, this is going into more detail than we probably have. But you, that's how you would get it, right? Yep. <laughs> OK, so how much time we got? Three minutes. Oh, my gosh. We got to do a rational function, and then I think you're good to go. But we won't be able to do it today. Oh, man. That's too bad. Wait, today is what I was talking about. Okay. This, like, one where we did this one, where it was, like, positive, positive, and then it went like that. That's right. Not right. So what this one would have been, though, then, if we did the next f double prime, then what that would have been is 0, and it would have either been negative, positive, or positive, negative. Oh, okay. See, this, so this had to be an inflection point. Oh, okay, I got you now. See what I'm saying? Yeah, that's just what I remember. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, because it failed the first derivative test. Uh, but then, okay. See what I'm saying? What did you do? What did they see you do? Yeah. Because this is one where it's increasing the whole way, so it has to be yes. one where it's, it's going like. 
that. Yeah. yeah. But when it's a second derivative test, it can't do that because it's right. Second derivative. Well, if it were positive positive on the second yeah. derivative test, then that would have had to be positive negative or negative positive on that one. Uh, okay, it can't be positive. positive. Right, it can't be. It's got to pass one of them. Uh, okay. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay.